And hello, fabulous AP students. This is your favorite teacher, Mr. Jacobson. I am excited to be with you today. Today, we're talking about the Protestant Reformation between 1450 and 1750. This is unit three of the AP curriculum. So let us begin. So the Protestant Reformation happens, but before it does, and we get into all that, I want to talk to you about people who sort of are the pioneers that eventually might lead up to this. So these are the pre-Protestant Reformation mover and shakers, the leaders. So we have John Wycliffe in England. And John Wycliffe, his main thing is he wanted to, he, he wanted to translate the Vulgate Bible, which was a Bible <clears throat> that the Catholic Church made. It was in Latin. In fact, the majority of Bibles are going to be in Latin. Latin is going to be the, the official spiritual language of the church, if you will. And nobody reads Latin or speaks Latin unless you're like a priest who was raised to, you know, to be a priest in the church. And so, um, nor could they even learn Latin because it was a forbidden language. You had to be affiliated with the church to do that. So anyway, uh, John Wycliffe is affiliated with the church and he wants to translate the Bible into English. And they're just not going to let him do it. So he, he's one that first pushes back at the church and says we should have our Bibles in different languages according to the vernacular of that region that it's in. So his followers are going to be called Lollards, and this idea of having an English Bible is going to continue. Um, and, and also John Wycliffe, he also believed that priests weren't necessary for salvation. In fact, he says that the scriptures really don't say that the priests were necessary. So we have people who are starting to push back against the church, you know, starting in around the mid um, 1300s. And then we have Jan Hus. And Jan Hus is, uh, he, he, he's, he was, uh, lived in around what we call Czech, Czech Republic today. And he, he spoke out against the church and its corruption, uh, similar to John Wycliffe. The thing is, is that John Wycliffe, he, he, he was labored a heretic. They told him to recant. He wouldn't recant. And then they, they burned him at the stake. So here we have uh, John Wycliffe. We have Jan Hus. And so Jan Hus becomes a martyr, if you will, for the Protestant movement, although the Protestant movement isn't really happening yet. But he, he, he is uh, inspiring people to go a little further out there. And even if it comes to your life being taken, so do it. And then we have Holdrick Zwingli. And Zwingli, he was born around uh, Switzerland area. And he campaigns in Geneva, which is a city in, in Switzerland, for religion that follows the Bible teachings. So he was opposed to celibacy of the clergy um, because that rule came long after the scriptures were written. In fact, no one really understood exactly where the Catholic Church got this idea of celibacy. They took some scriptures from the New Testament, which they, they to prove that that was that the priests needed to stay celibate. But for the longest time before the Catholic Church was formed, and even in the the scriptures, um, the apostles and things were likely married. And so anyway, so here are some people who started fighting against it. Now these are the Protestant Reformation leaders. Know their names. Martin Luther, he will start uh, Lutheranism. <clears throat> John Calvin, which will start Calvinism. And then Henry, the uh, King Henry VIII, which will start the Church of England. So let's talk about each of these people. So Lutheranism begins. The man who starts it is Martin Luther. This is the story of Martin Luther. He's a Catholic monk in Germany. So he has been taught by the church. He knows Latin. He knows Greek. He knows Hebrew. He's a pretty smart dude. Okay. However, he starts seeing corruption happen in the Catholic church and he doesn't like it. And he's a pretty vocal person. So he's going to go ahead and start vocalizing his um, discontent of the church, believing that the church is taking advantage of its people. So this is going to go on for some time. <clears throat> um, He's going to have a major problem with an idea called indulgences. And indulgences is a piece of paper that you could purchase for money. And it can basically um, 
absolve somebody or omit their sins or the punishments that they are going to get in the afterlife for those sins. And uh, so anyway, someone could buy that paper, which was an indulgence by the church. And the church is basically saying, this is a get out of hell free card. I'm using very simple terminology for it. And you couldn't, you, you could buy it for you or someone else who's living, or you could buy it for someone who is now dead and you are concerned about their soul. And so uh, people would spend large tracts of money to obtain an indulgence, usually for their dead, who they were in question about whether they went to heaven or not. And Martin Luther felt like, wow, you guys are selling salvation in essence. And salvation doesn't come through purchasing money. It comes through faith on Jesus Christ. And so he really had a hard time with this. He just went ahead and wrote the 95 Theses and posted it on the Wittenberg Church doors you can see in this picture over to the right and the 95 theses is just a fancy term for 95 arguments that he made against the catholic church of what they were teaching was not in the bible or according to the holy scriptures so he basically just rips them and uses the scriptures to say the scripture says this but they do this or they do this and the scripture doesn't mention anything about this and then he posts it to the door now um this is going to cause a spread of people going, yeah, the church is pretty dang corrupt. And since it was in a time when the printing press had been successfully diffused from China along the Silk Road, that technology is now available in England or, or in, in Western Europe, including England at this time. And so now they're going to use it to their advantage. And so this 95 Theses is going to be printed and printed. See, before the Catholic Church could just rip this up and deal with Luther. And then there was really no way to spread it, except word of mouth. But now they can't just rip it up because it can be printed a thousand times a day. And so the word can be more dispersed to the people. So Luther was labeled a heretic for all this. Uh, he was excommunicated from the church, but he didn't care at that point. In fact, I think he burned the excommunication paper uh, in front of the people who were his supporters. And so he just continued to protest against the church. He eventually will translate the Bible into, German, into the German vernacular. And he will be held at the, the uh, Diet of Worms. And, uh, and they will try to try him according to the, the laws of that land. And he'll be whisked away into a, 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 uh, a sanctuary where he'll be able to translate the Bible into, into the German language. And this is going to spark the Protestant Reformation. Uh, and you, we'll, we'll see what else happens. So one of his, a couple of beliefs on women, uh, he believed that women have direct access to God just like men. He promoted women's literacy. Women have a significant role in the family he preached, and also women should teach ch children the Bible. So he believed that women had a very important role in the family and had more um, views of women having more rights than even the church itself. So Calvinism. So Calvinism uh, was started by a man by, named John Calvin. And John Calvin was a French theologian who broke away from the Catholic Church around 1530. So this guy's living in France. He's also not liking what's going on. He's hearing about things about Luther, and, uh, and so that's going to inspire him. So he was believed, uh, believed people were predestined to go to heaven or hell regardless of their deeds. So he believed this idea that, you know, it really didn't matter um, whether you obey the commandments or not. Um, you, you are predestined by God before you even grace this earth to go to heaven or hell. However, a person who's committing all these sins wouldn't go to heaven. So you want, you know, basically people would say, oh, I'm the person who's destined to go to heaven and I will prove it by keeping all the commandments in the Bible. Um, which was, the, the, it was kind of like a self-fulfilling prophecy, if you will. So all the people who are des believe they are destined to go to heaven they would live their life to, to fit the, 
the, the rules of the commandments that were found in the Bible. Anyway, so followers in France under for uh, Calvinism and John Calvin were called Huguenots or Huguenots. And I'm going to go with Huguenots from now on. Um, and if you've heard of the Puritans of England, the people who came over, left England for religious freedom uh, to the Americas, those were called Puritans. The Puritans kind of fall from that Calvinistic way of thinking. And so in the picture here, we have Puritans in the Americas with their, their popular hat and, <clears throat> and popular garb. That comes from Calvinistic uh, religious line, not Lutheran. Okay, so the last uh, religion that's going to come from the Protestant Re Reformation is called the Anglicanism or the Church of England. And there's some story I have to give you here, so please bear with me. So King Henry VIII, okay, he is the king of England. He marries a girl named Catherine of Aragon, who happens to be the daughter of King Ferdinand and Queen Isabella of Spain. King Ferdinand and Queen Isabella are, the, are the, the very same people that financed Christopher Columbus's journey to the Americas. Okay, so you kind of seen the connection here? So Catherine and Henry are married, but Catherine cannot give him a male heir or a male baby. Okay, she had a couple of miscarriages. She does give him a healthy daughter, but that's about it. And Henry just sort of gets pretty fed up with this. And then he writes to the Catholic Church, because England at this point is under Catholicism. And he writes to the church, the Pope, and says, I want an annulment, which is kind of a softer way to say a divorce. So he could marry a wife that could carry, it could bear him a son that would carry on the Tudor uh, lineage name. So <clears throat> the Pope was put in a rock and a hard place because here you have a king of England who, who wants an, a, a divorce in essence. However, some of the staunchest supporters of Catholicism is King Ferdinand and Queen Isabella. And so what do you do? Well, he decided to say no. Because if he said yes, then he gave him permission to, uh, to kick to the curb uh, Ferdinand and Isabella's daughter, right? Which wouldn't be good. King Ferdinand and Isabella would have had a major problem with that as well. So he decided to side mainly with Spain and also with the Holy Roman Empire. And he says, uh-uh, not happening. You're stuck with her. Well, Henry got pretty pissed at that. And so he broke away from the Catholic Church completely. He severs all ties with them. A whole nation kingdom goes um, completely separate from the church. And he starts the Church of England. That was the first time a whole nation just sort of just severed all ties with the church. So he'll make his own church. And you know what happened? Surprisingly, I know you'll find this hard to believe, when he put in a petition for a divorce and he made that church called the Church of England and he put in the leaders of that church, at, he chose the leaders of, of that new church, the Church of England. When he put in that petition to get divorce, it was approved. <laughs> what are the chances? So he will divorce Catherine, who is this person in the right here. There's more. So he is then going to marry Anne Boleyn after he divorces uh, Catherine of Aragon. And she too could not give him a son. This, this guy, I'm not going to say poor guy because there's nothing poor about him um, morally. He's, he's a monster. Okay, But yet he couldn't get that son again. So what did he do? Oh, and she gave him another daughter. So Anne Boleyn and Catherine both give him a daughter, right? But what does he do? He uh, divorces Anne Boleyn, beheads Anne Boleyn, kills her, and then he marries many wives, which he beheads another wife as well in the process. Eventually, he'll get his son, but that son will die in his early age uh, as, as king. So... 
Henry, however, Henry VIII, will inspire other nations to break away from the Catholic Church because if you have a whole kingdom that can break away from the Catholic Church successfully with minimal repercussions, then that tells you perhaps the Catholic Church isn't as strong as they used to be. Maybe the Black Plague or the Crusades really did weaken the Catholic Church, and this is evidence of it. Moving on. So Catherine of Aragon gave him that daughter. That daughter's name is Mary I, also known as Bloody Mary. She's going to rule England for a little bit, and she's going to try to bring back Catholicism, and, and she's going to persecute the Protestants in England. However, Bloody Mary's not going to stay there very long. Uh, the people are going to get fed up with her, and then they're going to put in Elizabeth I, who is the daughter of Anne Boleyn, and she's going to support Protestantism, and from that point, and the, and the Church of England, and that from that point on, the England will be separate from the Catholic Church. So we have a Counter Reformation. So all these things are happening. Martin Luther's uh, causing a revolt. Calvin's causing a revolt. King Henry successfully breaks away. So now there's a counter-reformation. The Catholic Church is saying, oh, crap, we got to fix something here, okay? So the first thing they start doing is they continue this form of inquisitions. Inquisition is basically anyone who is a non-believer, um, um, anyone who's suspected of not being a Christian, a, a Muslim, or a Jew, then we will hold a court for them, and if they are found guilty, we will punish them, torture them, uh, chase them out of town, whatever, but we're going to have all pure Christians in that region. And so they're trying to seek out the non-believers. So this happens, is very popular in the, during the Spanish Inquisition, which is when <clears throat> uh, Europe finally takes control back of Muslim Spain. Remember, Spain was conquered and was Islamic for you know centuries, right? So they're gonna the, the the Western Christians are going to reconquer Spain, and there are many Muslims still living in Spain because that's been their home for hundreds and hundreds of years. However, if they're a non-believer, then they're going to they're basically told to leave or 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 get get tortured and persecuted and punished. And many people said, this is our home. I'm not leaving. I'll pretend to be a Christian, but deep down inside, I'll still be Jewish or Muslim. So that's what the Inquisition was, was who are those people who are hiding, who are saying they're Christian, but they're really not. And then they're going to take that Inquisition over to like Holland, Netherland region as well. So um, also Jesuits will also become a very popular thing. You'll have a religious order founded in 1540 by Ignatius of Loyola. Ignatius of Loyola is a pretty important name to know, so remember, you remember that? Basically, for the longest time, the Catholic Church didn't have to do missionary work, but now they're losing converts, and so they need to do missionary work, and Ignatius and the Jesuits are going to continue to uh, start that, that missionary effort to convert people. Now, the Council of Trent is going to happen. <clears throat> this Council of Trent is, okay, we're losing a lot of people. A lot of people are going to Protestantism. How can we stop this? Well, one thing they said was, you know what? Maybe that indulgence thing wasn't such a great idea. Maybe we probably should stop selling indulgences because that really pissed off people. And then others said, well, there's other things we could kind of fix too. You know, maybe the priests aren't as educated as they ought to be about the sacrament ceremonies and things like that. So they're going to start cleaning up corruption and abuses in the Catholic Church. They're also going to publish the index of prohibited books. And they're going to have a whole list of books that if any good Catholic has this book, um, then or any any non-believer as well, that 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 uh, that Catholicism has reigned over that region, then that book is going to be considered forbidden. You'll be labeled a heretic, and it's punishable by death, possibly. So they have a whole book that they publish that has a bunch of publications that are banned from the church. One of those is the Protestant copy of the Bible, and another one of the many are the writings of Copernicus, who was a scientist that said, the world is revolving around the sun. 
not the sun or other planets revolving around the world. And the Catholic Church said, no, 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 no. We, uh, we have already said that it is official that the earth is the center of the universe and anything that goes against that is that it would be a heretic. And so Copernicus and his writings, um, he, he is not going to recant. He is going to go to death over this. And a lot of people had great, great respect for Copernicus and his writings and also his courage. So what are some of the effects we see here? So the Reformation will be successful to the degree that if you look over here on the right, you're going to see, do you see all the brown area? That's all that remains Catholic, Roman Catholic, after, after the whole Protestant Reformation starts, starts, starts uh, swinging in full effect. However, in the northern European countries like England, Netherlands, um, Norway, Sweden, northern Germany, uh, all that region, that's going Protestant, uh, whether it's Calvinistic uh, or Lutheran or the Church of England, it's all breaking away from the Catholic Church. And there'll be a Spanish king named Philip II, and he is going to wage kind of like a Catholic crusade on the Netherlands. And for about 30 years or so, he's going to have control of this region right here, and he's going to create his own inquisitions and, 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 uh, and, and torture and intimidate people from uh, revealing Protestantism in any way. And he also is going to try to conquer and convert England. He's going to send the most fiercest uh, sh uh, ship fleet called the Spanish Armada. He's going to send that up to England, and it's going to be defeated uh, pretty soundly by the English naval power due to an act of, of weather or of God or however way you want to look at it. But there was a severe storm that hit which uh, disrupted the Spanish Armada from attacking effectively, destroyed many ships, and which allowed the English to, uh, to, to prevail over them, which was strange because at that time, Spain was the most powerful country in the world because they discovered America and they were so dang rich. However, when England will beat them at the, Spanish, at the, at the defeat of the Spanish Armada, then that's going to be a turning point for the rest of Europe to realize maybe Spain's not as powerful as they used to be. So anyway, I believe that's it. Go ahead and write your one-page summary. We'll talk to you at the end.